Welcome back to another episode of Scions of the Southland. Uh, yeah, it's what what is today? January twenty first, eight p.m. on on the West Coast. How's life, Jake? Back on the East Good. Coast. This is a very poor intro. I, I did not rehearse this. No, you didn't. Uh, usually, you stand in the mirror, spritz your mouth with like that stuff that singers use. Have a glass of tea ruminate over your intro but no no it's i'm doing all right 11 p.m eastern 10 p.m god's time it's uh it's a good night in atlanta a little tired but we got a we got an interesting slate of things to talk about this week i don't know if it'll be super long but but definitely different than the usual fare i'd say yeah i mean there's it's like the first really busy week of non-rev season the first two weeks of the semester as a warm up, but now you're really fitting in the events. And once baseball and softball kick in a high gear next month, you're you're looking at a steady stream of like three to four to five events on campus every single weekend. And this is, you know, this is a precursor. This is where it starts to get fun. Buddy, you are telling me. I think. I think. Uh... Yellow Jacket Roundup hit 2,000 words uh, this week, which it usually doesn't do outside of softball. But before we jump into into the tech varsity sports, we don't usually talk club sports on this podcast, but I would like to at least shout out GT Hockey because I uh, spilt some ink on them. But uh, but they're, they're I, I don't know. It's it's I love being a club athlete, but not a lot of things we do turn heads quite like what GT Hockey does. Uh, down in Savannah every year, so they went to play FSU and UGA, and they lost twice in double overtime and shootout, respectively, which is a tough way to a tough way to lose the Thrasher Cup, but uh, but definitely a cool event um, and worth talking about. So between that and you know tennis being back and swimming being in the thick of the season and track being back too, and of course women's basketball is a lot to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, where do you want to start? We got a list of like, I don't know, like 10 things right here. I think save men's basketball for last because we can talk about them till kingdom come. Uh, I would like to remember to go into a little bit of baseball too at the end, but why not just do it in order? Um, I think if we bookend it with basketball, um, that would make a lot of sense. And the women were one and one this week. Wins against uh, Syracuse midweek yes. and Boston College in the Sunday game. Hmm. Ah. So well, I guess I guess my piece on women's basketball. They had like the Cuse game was dominant. I think they were up by fifteen at at least for large stretches of that game. They, they maxed lost out to twenty nine. Yeah. So the loss to BC is where. I don't know. Things got screwy. Um, that game really was not as close as the scoreline indicated. Uh, if you look at the game flow chart, which I had pulled up somewhere on my computer and now can't find, um, if you look at the game flow chart, there is a vast little space uh, where BC was leading for probably 12 or 15 points for the majority of the game. And then Tech is able to cut it back down to four points. Uh, four or five points right at the end uh, end of the game, and they just get some rotten luck on fouls and free throws, and just can't uh, can't complete the comeback. And it just seemed like a, for that game specifically, it just seemed like I wouldn't say a systematic failure, but but Boston College definitely figured something out, uh, and it'll be interesting to see. Uh, how other teams in ACC play react to that. Uh, I I didn't watch the game, so I can't say for sure what it is they figured out, but based on the stats, the the advanced analytics, it, it looks like, you know, Tech had a really rough go of it up in uh, Chestnut Hill. Dude, they were on campus, and shame on me. Oh, I, was, uh, I was out and about Sunday, which took me away from tennis and women's basketball but don't worry we have plenty to talk about with tennis um but um women's basketball i don't i don't know there's 
I don't know. It's the ACC. Like, it's competitive. They're in third right now, so you're, you're going to lose a couple games. I'd rather them beat a Louisville or, like, an NC State kind of thing. But, you know, if we can stick in third in the Atlantic Coast Conference, which is, I mean, it, it's Atlantis, Atlantic Coast Conference basketball. Like, it, it's good stuff. Third place should make the should make the tournament. It's not volleyball where they can, however, justifiably snub the second place team in the conference. Though that was a different set of circumstances. Obviously, still salty to this uh, day. I mean, obviously, we're still salty. We're still talking about it. But um, but no. As far as women's basketball goes, they they host Carolina on Thursday at home. I'll I'll head over there and we can kind of touch base on them in person for the first time in a couple weeks. Um, and then uh, they get Duke on the road. Those are both winnable games. Um, Tech, I don't know if it's a Sunday thing or what. I don't think it's like a being at home thing, but they're they're railing FSU and Syracuse on the road, which are two places that Tech notoriously has really not been able to see a lot of success. Um, I, I think, according to the press release, that uh, Tech's first ever win in the Carrier Dome was, uh, you know, Thursday. So that'll tell you a thing or two about going into that building and winning, whether you're playing men's or women's basketball or lacrosse. Football's a different beast. But, you know, like the Carrier Dome in these sports is not an easy place to play, no matter how good or bad Syracuse is. Um, I, I don't know. I... It sucks to drop winnable games because Boston College should be a winnable game in every sport except maybe ice hockey and Lord knows that Georgia Tech does not have varsity ice hockey. So, um, I don't know. Like, you see them on the schedule. You can't count them as an automatic win. But but at the same time, it's not like they're dropping games to Kennesaw and Georgia State here. Like, these are, these are competitive teams. So, I, I don't know. I think I might have mentioned this last week, but uh, after they lost to Wake, there was uh, a comment on YJR that was like, oh, like this is bad. This will like be a millstone around their neck. And I don't see like, like this Boston College loss dropping them all that much. They're still on the eight line in the Greenville Regional. So like they're, they're, they're in good position. It's just not that consistent yet, you know? Yeah, and I... <sighs> There, there's a couple thoughts that came to mind while you're talking. Number one, it's this team seems to have a weird Texas and football vibe to it, where <laughs> Texas can really get up for the big games. You know, like recent Tom Herman Texas teams, they really get up for Oklahoma, your your Kansas States, your your Sugar Bowls, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then the Alamo Bowl this year, but they dropped some clunkers. Uh, I guess this was under Charlie Strong, but 2016 versus Kansas. Like, <laughs> they, Maryland like, back to back uh, openers. Maryland, but yeah, like, it, it's just, it's a very interesting situation. On a, and it's a very, I feel like it's a very valid parallel to make because tech can get up for these, for these large games. Like, I have, I have little doubt that when it comes time to play Louisville and it com- comes time to play play the Wolfpack, they're going to get up and they're going to give both of those teams a fight and they're going to stake their claim as a true no like top three team in in the ACC as that as that creme de la creme uh, for the 2019 season. But you drop it's it's these 50 50 balls to to BC to Wake. Um, that dropping those is what's, it's not, you know, you, you, like you say, it's a very competitive conference top to bottom. And especially it's like in football where that middle 50% is just a mess, a mess yeah. in a good way here, a mess in a bad way in football, but it's, it's everyone can win on any, uh, and this is an, this is definitely an example of that. It's just, it, it's like you're saying. Where to do? Where do the jackets set the tone? Set that consistency and start playing game in, game out, road away, opponent strength notwithstanding. When do they play consistently good to great basketball? 
Well, we haven't really seen them playing down to the to the non conference part of the schedule. Oh, so absolutely I, I'm not. They were blowing teams out in the non con. Yeah, and and that's that's where I'm gonna make up a uh, use a term I just made up in my head called uh, advanced passnering. Um, and I, I use this phrase uh, because we've been hearing for four years that we have to give Josh Passner the benefit of the doubt. We need to let him get four recruiting classes in, get four, like, like give the, what's his line? Get old and stay old, right? He was, he was king of colloquialisms and, and phrases before Jeff Collins. He was proto Jeff, right? So, mm-hmm. so use, using that logic, Nell Fortner is not just playing with house money right now. She is going into the Bellagio, into their safe, and robbing uh, unthinkable millions of dollars while the casino owner tries to mess with George Clooney's ex-wife or whatever. You know, like thank you like for that. Nell reference. Fortner, thank you. thank you for that yes, one. Nell Fortner is in is in the vault, right? She lost her two best scorers. So when you get into this, these more contestable games, right? Boston College maybe ten and eight, but that's not that's not that bad. Like it's it's not amazing. It's not like world beating, but they'd probably get a WNIT bid right now if, if it came to it. Um and if you or if they keep playing how they've been playing. Um but if you if you look at it, they're doing this against teams that are more comparable, if not up to their level or the level they've been playing at, while at the same time they they lost their two best scores, right? So if they're going to be inconsistent, it's because they have a lot less depth than you'd think they would have otherwise had. Because it's like you're scooching up, like Jasmine Carson has to fill all these shoes, and the, and she's had a great year uh, and has been able to like replicate some of that production from Balligan and Dixon leaving. Um, I won't even bother to call them Elizabeth because that's confusing. Um, but you know, like that's not. Nell is overplaying her hand, or not, not in a bad way, but you know she's 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 being forced to deploy her troops in disadvantageous positions. Yes, and not everybody's going to have a a eighteen point night. Every like you can't. And granted, Boss College only scored fifty five. Like you only need a couple kids in double figures to do it. But when you have three get there, and you know that that's just kind of all she wrote, then. That's kind of what you got. She's coaching a team that she was put into kind of late and late in a recruiting cycle. And not that I'm saying we shouldn't expect more because like they're in these games, but, but this is not the, this is not the, we're all in, all our chips are on the table. This is the year that everything lines up. This is, Mm -hmm. we got one more year of Francesca Pond. We got a couple more years of Kira Fletcher. Let's see what else falls into place. Mm-hmm. And, and I think so far it has. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I, I just wish you, you get some of these games back. And I, I, we talk about this all the time in the context of soccer, where we're, we're talking about fixture congestion and squad rotation when you're playing uh, multiple games in the span of a week. This is probably what the third game in a week. Um, yeah third four and two weeks i mean they're playing two games a week it's you have to see some rotation and like you said not everyone's gonna have an 18 point night uh, every single night so fact of life i guess it's acc play i guess you just gotta you gotta grind through it i mean they're like i mean i kind of hate that we're complaining though yeah, like, I, t- I totally this is agree. A good te- this is a good team that's sitting at third in the conference, and all we can talk about is they shouldn't have dropped this game. They shouldn't have dropped this game. And obviously I was the one that started the you know the discussion about, man, you shouldn't drop this game. But still, I think third in the conference behind two teams that are, are otherwise undefeated in the conference, pretty pretty good. Yeah, I, I'll say two things. One is snark. Um we don't talk about soccer. You talk about soccer, and I nod and pretend to know what's going on. Um, but it's a, that it's is a, a general we. It's it's a general world weary we. All right, uh, Emperor Akshay, King Akshay, keep using the royal we. Um, but no, I uh, 
the one the one thing I'll say, I don't want to sit on the eight line when it comes down to to mm-hmm. bracketology. I want to be on the seven, the six, the five would be ideal. Um, or the four, uh, or or drop to ten. You know, like I don't want to be sitting in this. All right, yeah, we beat a nine seed. That was a pretty tight game, but now we get to go get our you know lunch handed to us by Baylor, UConn, Louisville. South Carolina, God, the old, Missouri the old, State, uh, 20, uh, 2011 special. Yep, just get there and then whammy, like you're you're done. You're you got beat by thirty by one of the four god tier teams on the planet. No, like I'd rather drop one more line or drop two more lines or go up one or two. You know, like don't sit in this weird limbo land, especially in a top heavy sport like women's basketball. And I think that's what we saw last year before this sort of steady and gradual decline at the end of the season between dropped results and dropped coaches dropped results and dropped coaches to to put it mildly um we were i want to say we were at the eight line or like even as high as the six line uh heading into the middle or the end of january probably closer to the middle of february i would say uh and then the bottom falls out. And if that's mm-hmm. like, and that's probably with, I mean, you have two freshmen that are very high scoring and very high producing, but in, in last year's squad, but at the same time, you've been able to, Nell has been able to effectively replace that. Like you're saying, they, she's been able to effectively replace that production with a bunch of, with a bunch of other players on the team rotating in and supporting Kara Fletcher and Francesca Pond. Um, so that that should probably be your barometer. That six line, that seven line is probably your barometer of saying, hey, this is where we need to be by the, our expectations based on last season. Because last season, you take out the last 10 games that are just weird results. That's where they probably would have been. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't know. I don't have a lot to add. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them uh, in person Thursday night. So... I guess we'll yeah. we'll be able to reassess. I think, you know, obviously going to Cameron Indoor is a hard place to win. Harder for the men because that is louder and fuller. But you know, like it'll be it'll be another good week. None of these weeks are off weeks that we see coming up. You know. All right, men's tennis. Uh, yeah. Um, your note on the inline um says single sweep versus Columbia will hurt. Um, and here's where I'll disagree because the beautiful thing about this weekend that we just saw was it was all exhibition, right? So we got Illinois, Columbia, and South Carolina, um, all teams ranked in the top or in like 20th to 10th in the country, right? And got to play them without consequence. Just get the experience, rack it up, whatever. And I don't think, I didn't see the games, uh, Sunday, but I was there Saturday and Monday. Um, and especially we didn't win a singles match on, Monday against South Carolina, but I think five, or we played six. So four of the six went to three sets, and one of the other two was a 13-11, 7-6 tiebreaker, which is the most back-breaking way to lose a two-set match. Um, and uh, one of the, the three-set losses started with one of our freshmen who's been playing team – Georgia Tech team tennis for what a week and two days now um, took the number twenty four guy in the country six zero in the first set. So I I don't think saying that sweeps against Columbia and South Carolina are gonna be like oh what was us because if you look at us across the board we were close in both of those and uh, and the doubles we didn't lose a single uh, a single doubles point and we were eight of ten on the weekend. I'll take that. Eleven times out of right. ten. On the uh, on the women's side, though, those were. I mean, I I assume this was also part of the exhibition weekend. No, those were both. Those both counted. Uh, so we went two and zero with the women's and zero and zero with the men. Okay, well, we won the ones that counted. Um, I they got two more today too against Mercer. I'll take it. Um, yeah. I did see that the result versus Furman was a came down to the last match. I, I want to say. It was third uh, third set on court six, which if you guys are unfamiliar with college tennis, 
Um, it, it's played to seven points, uh, but it's best to seven. So if you get to four, then play stops unless you – it's like a, just, you know, play them out for fun or whatever. Um, but Tech was – took the doubles point and then went uh, – lost – uh, three of the first five singles matches to finish, and so court six is what like the, the lowest court, right? Um, so that is not really what you want the game in the hands of against Furman. <laughs> so, but you know they won, no, no problem there. The point of them scheduling a lot of these early matches is to bank these wins, kind of in the same way, you know, like your women's basketball non-con will be a little bit softer. You want to. Uh, Make sure you're scheduling an FCS in football or something like that. Um, but Furman does randomly have a really, really good singles player. I think she's top 25 in the country um, who beat us on singles. And then, of course, her doubles pairing is pretty solid, too. So not the worst thing in the world. They're stronger than your average mid-major. But, you know, 4-0, since we last talked about them, we'll take it. Yeah, no complaints. I am not a women's tennis expert, so we shall move on to another sport that I am also not an expert at. Swim and dive. Give me the lowdown. Ah, well, see, I am an expert on this sport. Um, out, out of all the things we talk about on this year' podcast, football, basketball, women's and men's, baseball, softball, tennis, um, I'd say that I know the most about swimming and diving, and it's, uh, it's a split weekend. They so... The weird thing about swimming is there's really no set conference schedule. You just kind of show up at ACCs at the end of the year um, and try and schedule a couple in the meantime. DLDR, they ain't played nobody, Paul. um, Not necessarily because we we don't have Georgia on the schedule anymore, which will infuriate me to no end. Um, But we do have Auburn and South Carolina, which are – and Tennessee earlier in the season. But last week, Auburn, this week, South Carolina. which all three of those are um, very highly regarded teams. So um, men and women didn't really look great against, well, men looked okay against Auburn, but you get the point, I'm rambling. Um, men beat South Carolina, um, and the the way they did it is good too, because we had contributions and wins from Kyle Pampudis and uh, Christian Ferraro, who are our... Um, how you say it. it's uh, are like our mainstays, right? They're like Jose Alvarado or Michael DeVoe. They're the people you expect the big performance from. Yeah, no. So we did it with the men won and the women lost. Um, collect my thoughts on the other two uh, because we had vamp, two other vamp, guys vamp, vamp, vamp. Uh, take, take a couple wins. Um, surprising names. But um, Dylan Scott, that's who it was. He's a freshman. Um, hadn't seen a ton from him but him uh doubling up the 500 and the thousand which are uh the two longest events you usually see in um in dual meet season uh in a couple hours to win both of them is very impressive uh with his times were great too so of the 13 wins tech got on the day six were from those guys um kyle barone who again more unsung of a hero uh, won the 100 backstroke and 200 backstroke. Then Albert Z won the 100 freestyle. Um, so you had you had Kyle Pampudi swimming off events um, and Kyle, Christian Ferraro taking on events. And the two of them, you know, you can you can build a team around Kyle, Christian, uh, Cami Hidalgo, and Emily Hilgenfritz on the women's side with their two wins apiece. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You know the. You, are you familiar with the fan poll stuff? The like the polling of where you yes. think your team's at and stuff. Yeah. Um, if you had asked me last week if I was confident about this team and what they're going to look like um, at ACCs, I would have said no. I would have still said yes at NCAA's because the top will be the top. Um, but I don't know. With if if Dylan Scott, um, Kyle Barone, uh, Albert Z, you know these. Um, not salt of the earth types, but you know the ones that are are our depth pieces. First of in, first in the gym, last out, hardworking gym rat types. I mean, I don't know about, kind of guys. I don't know about that. I don't spend time at their practices, but if 
if the Moses Wrights and Evan Coles of the swim and dive team, or your, I don't know, your, your, your lineman, your, your, your second string lineman, you know, Get like the, the point. If, if the next men up keep stepping up, then they'll be fine at ACCs. The women don't have that kind of depth for them to be like, yeah, they'll be fine. But I don't know. Men swim and dive quietly solid, um, quietly a solid meet. Good win. 157, 153 over good competition. Cool. So that rounds out the rest of the slate other than our main course for today or yes, secondary sir. course. Oh, track. Ah, I yes. Mean. The running people. Yes. We're good at cross country. The cross country like events saw success this weekend. That is all. Good. You know, targeted excellence is is very underrated. True, true. And as far as uh my one line about baseball goes, we got another t- top 25 poll. So I'll take that too. Yeah, I think it was 21st in Baseball America. Yep. And 19th in D1 Baseball. Yep, that too. Yeah, we started around there last year. We started probably low 20s, um, unranked in some polls. Sure. And, I mean, turned yep. out pretty well. I think we were unranked in Baseball America. They've always been a little bit slower. D1 Baseball, I don't want to say they're more responsive to the trends, but they don't, I don't, I don't know, they're less conservative, I guess, it seems, with how they move teams up and down. It's interesting. The 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 dichotomy of the two makes for interesting poll watching, you know? Yeah. D1 Baseball, and now it's Sister Sight, D1 Softball as well. Um, they... I don't know if Baseball America has live scouts, but they but with D1 Baseball sending a lot of scouts our way last season, you yes, saw, I think, a very accurate representation of how that team was doing throughout the year uh, from, yeah. from D1 Baseball. Yeah, um, and RIP Georgia Tech softball's dreams of being ranked in the inaugural first ever D1 softball poll um, January 21st at... 2 p.m. to January 21st at 2:02 p.m. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, it's it's interesting to see the difference between the two. I'm, and I'm glad that D1 softball puts it all in one place because one thing I struggle with writing for volleyball, not so much volleyball because they have the coaches poll, but like softball, you kind of got to lean into into not RPI. Yeah, like I don't know. I I trust there's that. No- there's, there's there's more national coverage on it, you know? There's just no good single metric ranking for some of these some of these non rev sports. And I think having <laughs> more polls, as counterintuitive as it sounds, having more polls other than just the coaches helps out immensely when you're trying to get an idea of, of how these teams are doing. Well, there's two comparisons you can make to that. First being I trusted recruiting rankings more when there was more than two sites doing it uh, for football. And uh, like, like just in my own experience, the swimming and diving coaches poll is totally whack. So like, you know, it, it helps to have more cooks in the kitchen in this case, I think. Context is king. Yes. Agreed. All right. Main course, main entree time. Well, I guess this is really the secondary since we spent like 20 minutes talking about women's basketball. Yeah, I was surprised. Good, good for us. We're we're really spreading the wealth today. But progressive. Um, yeah, you All know right. me, very progressive. Um, Men's basketball still weird, still very weird. Uh, they got outlasted by UVA on when was that? That was this weekend, Saturday. Saturday yeah, ish. yeah, and Notre Dame too. And Notre Dame. They it was a weird, rough week for them after a very. I mean. You take a win versus North Carolina, and then there was a Boston College game in there somewhere that I vaguely remember, but that was a beatdown. And then you take a very close miss versus Duke, and then you put together two more close misses in the following week. It was... They didn't capitalize on it at all. I mean, in pure results, yeah, they totally did not capitalize on it. but, But I think... Looking at looking at the numbers here, uh, if I do say so myself, um, Tech was based on the modeling that we do casually at uh, from the Rumble seat. 
Tech had a projected win probability of 55% in the Notre Dame game. Uh, and I guess, in my defense, only 43% in the Virginia game. But I think the Virginia game is more marred by turnovers. Whereas in the Notre Dame game, things were relatively more clean. But the shooting was more off the charts in that yeah. game. Um, so that's like a function of Virginia being a the number one defense or whatever in the country. Yeah, I mean, you looked at at the margin in the first half. I remember looking up at the board, and we were shooting 67%, right? But because of how many times, if you turn the ball over that many times, of course your numbers are going to look better, you know? Like, you have to, there, you have to have a certain... You have to make up the difference somewhere, and once once you run into that defense, like preventing you from taking good looks while you're still turning the ball over, then you're going to have those issues. And I I think I think the UVA and Notre Dame results and the final score and that margin look similar, so it's easy to like on the surface level take away the same conclusions, but they really didn't play out like the same game, at least in my no my. The uh, eye test. I don't. I don't think they played out the same either. And I think Notre Dame was different in that it came down to a couple of missed shots. Notre Dame wasn't able to shut us down completely. Um, yeah. Their defense was still playing pretty loose late into that game, and I, I very clearly remember they let us in back at the end of that game. They we kept did. giving up drives to Jose Alvarado and Michael DeVoe. Yeah, um, and, then, and a note on a note on that before we before we go on because I don't want to forget this. It, it against Notre Dame, you cannot overstate how important it is to have a fan base and a crowd with energy and that turnout for your games. Because mm-hmm. I don't think Georgia Tech claws back into that game and doesn't hang in the Duke game if people are just there being blase about it you know like you can't look at rex fluger's stat line and tell me that the crowd specifically heckling him the whole game did not play into that game that man couldn't buy a shot you know and and that's that's where the vibe is different right because you go from from being uh feeding off the player's energy and them feeding off of you and the virginia game didn't really feel like like the, the the emotional test didn't really seem to match like Instead of Rex Fluger not being able to buy a shot, it was Michael DeVoe who ha- had like a similar kind of struggle. Like, granted, he was still on the board, but it- it's weird to see that turnaround between the two. Yeah, I, I, I'm a person, so I so can't comment on that. But but I did some charting out after the Virginia game of Michael DeVoe's uh, shooting percentage or his true shooting percentage. And it is, I mean, it's it's gotten worse and worse, I would say. Um, or maybe not worse and worse, but it's it's not in a particularly pretty state, I guess, to yeah. say it to, to say it as nice as possible. Um, I will say that in a small sample size versus Virginia, he did have a hundred percent true shooting percentage, but also he took three shots, he made three shots scored six points, and then was sidelined for probably half of the game with a nagging foot injury. So, you know, his, I think losing one of your best shooters, the influence of that is is pretty outsized. Like, it, it has a very large impact on the game. And then Virginia, unlike Notre Dame, plays a much more stifling brand of defense. Oh, and yeah, those nine blocks, I'll show you that. Notre Dame, Tech shot. 61 percent uh on two point shots right and then versus virginia tech shot 56 percent. it's i mean five percent difference you can call a sample size yada 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 you just you see that notre dame was letting tech get away with a lot uh, a lot more whereas virginia you had to fight tech had to fight for that 56 percent. this was not yeah given up Virginia was making every shot hard. And and that's what did keep them in the game is that they could keep shooting. Because, you know, like, if I don't know. I, I'd say I, we looked cleaner with the ball in the second half, I think, than in the first half. And obviously we did 
come back from a deficit, so that helps. But um, I don't know. And I, I don't think you put this all at the, at the team's feet. I think maybe the game plays out a bit differently if Pastor Pastner has another timeout at the end there. or um, You get or a couple they, calls that swing the other way. There was one yeah. like weird possession out of bounds call that was just did not look called properly on the floor that went yes. against tech. They did this thing that they have a knack of doing where they weren't out of, like they weren't out of these games. Like they keep losing games close. They gave us hope and it was there. And you know, we came up just short. It is it, it's great to it's great to have a good basketball team and it's great to have a basketball team with fight and it's really great when both of those things overlap. There's there's something to be said for the continual grit of this team and I think that's something that we have not really seen in the last yep. couple of teams. I, I will yep. say. Um and there there's this team knows that it's tournament quality. This team knows that um it can be top half in the ACC and it's it's putting together these performances versus the ACC's heavyweights for the most part and you know it's it's hard to argue against what is effectively a quality loss sometimes but at the same time Ooh, if you're you seeing the quality the, loss word <laughs> okay but but it comes with the caveat right if you're seeing the same mistakes take this team out over and over again it's turnovers it's poor free throw shooting it's <laughs> yeah Honestly, it's just those two. It's turnovers and, and poor free throw shooting. If you don't have those in the first half versus Virginia, that's a completely different ball game. Those are free possessions that you're giving Virginia that they they wouldn't have. If you're making the continuations if, too, yeah. If uh, Tech hits a couple more uh, free throws in a very poor free throw shooting game for both sides in the Virginia game. That that becomes that five point score margin now creeps closer to three or to two. There's these recurring themes, and I we've pointed them out every after like almost every single game. You can call the last two games quality losses. You can call it like near misses. You can sort of explain it away however you want to and spin it to be more positive. But the fact of the matter is, these are recurring mistakes that just have not been fixed. I don't have a lot to add. Um, I'll say I did my part. Um, there's a, a swim club people that wanted to go to the game. Helpful because there's 150 people in the org trying to get as many people to go. And there was two girls that were like, Jake, we've been to four games now. We haven't seen a win. And uh, they didn't show up on Saturday. And uh, we still lost. So obviously that's not the, uh, the cure That's not the kicker, you know? I, yeah. I appreciate you preying on superstition and trying. I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. Uh, make your free throws, kids. Yep. I strongly suggest that you stand at a foul line at a charity stripe and sink 100 before you go in for dinner. Uh, and then give Ch Coach Josh Passner a call. Yeah, true. Maybe they just want to go to the gas station and get snacks. That's why they play good on the road. I don't know. I, I just – I don't get it. You have – this team is – does not have a conference win yet at home, but it is, it is like four and one on the road, right? Yeah, more the uh, most wins on the road in the ACC under Passner. Go figure. I mean, he had two or three combined in the last <laughs> couple of years, so yeah. I mean, low bar, but it's still commendable. Like there has been, like we're saying, there has been improvement. I'm trying not to get like super hot takey sports talk radio host, but like. There has been improvement. Yep. It is just not in the two recurring fatal flaws of the program over the last couple of years where that improvement has shown itself. Bro, my favorite Georgia Tech tradition is missing the first free throw of a one and one Do not at me. They've, they've made both of those free throws in consecutive games before. Or like recently. Recently, yeah. So it, they, they're they capable of making those of both free throws in a set especially late in games when they're in the double bonus. It's just not happening. Yeah. Until they fix those things, we're just going to be talking in circles. So we'll let yeah, these good I think I've, 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 uh, I've unspooled enough yarn uh, on this one. Ugh. Mr. It's Grant. It's a rambling episode, dude. But it's a rambling wreck of an episode. 
and a hell of a one too. Anyway, Mr. Grant, do you want to read off the schedule for this week in Georgia Tech sports? Sure. Um, we only got three more weekends, I think, without baseball and uh, two without softball. So here we go. Um, men's tennis uh, was home on Monday against South Carolina and women's uh, today against Mercer. They swept both games against Mercer, so that was good. Um, tomorrow, so I assume this will go out on Wednesday. So tonight, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, uh, men's basketball, Louisville, 7 p.m. on your local regional sport network. Thursday, come sport, support women's basketball at home versus North Carolina at 6 p.m. Uh, there was 2,600 people at the last game, which is very good of a draw increasing. for uh, women's it basketball. An increasing number. I was going to say, they, they deserve those eyes, so good for them. Um, and then we got track back up in Clemson again uh, for the second time in three weeks or third time in three weeks. I can't remember what they did last weekend. Um, oh, Vanderbilt was last weekend. Um, so that's Friday, Saturday. Um, and then we also got tennis Saturday, Sunday. They're both at ITA indoors. Um, I think the men have a decent shot in their opening round um, playing Oregon, I want to say. Um, but they're over in College Station, and the women will be in Columbia, which, man, a lot of traffic for the uh, for the non-rev sports to various cities in South Carolina so far this semester. And then, of course, rounding out the slate, we got men's basketball at home, 4 p.m. on Saturday. If you're watching at home, your regional sport network, and women's basketball at Duke on Sunday, the usual 2 p.m. matinee in Durham on uh, ACC Network Extra, the X. Can we call it the X? I like that. That just sounds weird. Fine, whatever. Yeah, I, I like ACC and X. It sounds futuristic and very 2020. Well, we are in the future now then, I guess. Yeah, this is supposed to be the year where we had flying cars. And uh, Look at us now. We have really crappy electric scooters and uh, I don't know. I, don't, I had another joke for this that I've, I've lost now. And... Uh... I don't know, but R.I.P. Lime, you won't be missed. Womp womp. Uh, I will say that the men's basketball game that's a, that you said 4 p.m. at McCamish on Saturday, that is the back end of a home-and-home home with North Carolina State, of which that was the first game of the season, yes? Yep. We were undefeated yeah. after that game. Undefeated in conference, top of the ACC for a single, well, actually for the better part of two, two and a half months. Uh yeah, until we played Syracuse. Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, yep. not great anymore, but it was good at that point. Oh, yeah, for one one shining moment. Isn't that what basketball is all about? God, I love that. I love that clip show. I, I don't care at all most of the time about the Final Four and the National Champion because it's never usually us, but I will I will stand that clip show. So much Loyola, 20... Uh... 18. That was great. Sister Jean. Um, yep. Well, I will uh, see you next time. Same bad time, same bad channel. Sounds like a plan. The rest of y'all, we will see you later. <laughs>